everyone, welcome back to the Orthopedic Tutor channel. Today we'll be talking about spine tuberculosis. Maybe some of you will would wonder why we need to know this kind of infection. Well, tuberculosis is basically infection, a tuberculosis type of infection, and well, some countries may not see this disease quite frequently but in developing countries with high populations and those in the Southeast Asia region or even in some parts of Asia you could find this infection very commonly now before we go on to discussing all of these I'm just going to explain to you the basics of uh, what is going on in a patient who has been exposed to a tuberculosis and Afterwards, in this video, we will be discussing about the basics and also the diagnosis of a spine tuberculosis. Furthermore, regarding the radiologic evaluation and so on to the management and also the atypical spinal tuberculosis will be discussed on the second part of this video. Now, let's move on to what actually happens in our body when we are exposed. As you can see here, these are the timelines that go from weeks to years and these are what happens with increasing your immunity and the ones below are what happens with decreased immunity. So as we can see here, when one individual has a decreased immunity, within periods of hours, the lesion would form a primary complex over at the lung tissue, and it could also result in cassation in the lymph node region. Now, this kind of lesion with along with the increasing immunity, it will heal itself and form a scar. But sometimes, when our immune system are not as good as it should be, this primary complex could develop into a progressive primary tuberculosis, and it could even progress into a massive hematogenous dissemination with in decreasing level of immunity, causing spreading of these types of bacteria all around the body forming miliary type of tuberculosis. Now with increasing immunity, this primary complex could also develop into a latent lesions with the organisms, they became dormant and they lie in the lung tissue and also in some extra pulmonary tissues and with decreasing immunity and through time as it progress it may reactivate and form secondary tuberculosis now reinfection could also induce the formation of secondary tuberculosis and it could develop into a localized caseating destructive lesion over at the lung here forming caseation and scar especially at the apex of the lung but it could also progress into a secondary tuberculosis as seen in some extra pulmonary site. Now, this is where the spine tuberculosis lies over at this particular region of pathophysiologic process. Now, let's move on to the basics. Now, basically, you can find this uh, pathology in with an increased incident in individuals with immunocompromised state and it could also be found in HIV positive patients with CD4 count of around 50 to 200 cells and you could also say that around 15% of tuberculosis is happening at extra pulmonary region and usually around 5% of them have spine involvement while per definition TB tuberculosis infection of the spine they usually use only have around two-thirds of them only have abnormal chest x-ray and 20% of them have negative tests for PPD of tuberculin or are even allergic. We'll discuss uh, this type of test later on on the next part of the video. Now moving on, knowing the basic pathophysiology and how it occurs, we could readily explain where the location should be. So as this infection form around the spine, usually the early stages of the spine tuberculosis is very similar to those of the pyogenic infection. And it usually sp uh, is the result of a hematogenous spread from a dormant latent lesion, but it could also be a directly inoculated 
uh, or direct extension of the disease itself. Now, another study also suggested that venous or lymphatic roots may also be important compared to the arterial system for the dissemination of this condition. Now, usually this spine tuberculosis, they go to certain areas within our vertebral body and therefore it helps us identify this lesion through x-ray findings. Now, these are the most common types. They are divided into four main types known as the paradiscal, central, anterior, or atypical forms. The atypical forms typically is involving the neural arch or the posterior element of the uh, vertebral body which is the, around the lamina, pedicles and so on. Now the paradiscal type is the one that forms around the metaphyseal area and it spreads anterior, uh, anteriorly through the undersurface of the anterior longitudinal ligament. And they usually we may skip from one vertebrae to the other with sparing of the disc. Uh, usually some will, will although the disc is spared, some would usually find this space narrowing which may be caused by direct extension of the disease or also dehydration of the disc secondary to the altered function of the vertebral plate. And next would be the central type which you could find in the mid vertebral area and usually mostly are isolated on one vertebrae only. Now vertebrae collapse is common in these types of uh, disease localization with uh, the end results of significant deformity which you could resemble with uh, which could resemble the osteoporotic compression fracture sometimes found in the elderly population the next type would be the anterior type where it spreads underneath the ALL uh, it's quite similar to this one to the paradiscal type but the exclusion is that in the anterior type it usually extends several segments and you could find a scalloped anterior erosion we'll show you this in the radiographs later on so the ischemia caused by the pus which pre puts on pressure on the anterior aspect of the, the uh, vertebrae will cause a scallop type of appearance and the MRI will usually reveal a subligamentous abscess. Now the classification scheme, there are lots of it and you could just choose a couple that is most commonly known, most commonly used and be sure to memorize them because it helps guide the treatment. Now we're going to talk about one that has been there for a long time which is the classification scheme by Seddon. They classify this condition into paraplegia of the active disease and also paraplegia of the chronic disease. With paraplegia of the active disease, usually the external pressure that goes on to the spinal cord is caused by the epidural granuloma, abscess, or even sequestered bone and disc and pathologic subluxation and dislocation that occurs on the spine due to the bone destruction, but it could also be caused by dural invasion. While for the paraplegia of the chronic disease, it is usually only caused by external Pressure. The pressure itself is caused usually by fibrous heel tissues and also by the epidural granuloma or the kyphotic deformity that forms by the ridge of bone anteriorly. Now, the other classification scheme that is commonly known is those by the GATA, which classify the condition based on seven different clinical and radiographic criteria. I'm going to show you this table here. I'm going to close this okay so this uh, classification by GATA or the Gulen Military Medical Academy <coughs> sorry they classify it to three different types which is the type 1 type 2 and type 3 as you can see here that in the type 1a once again based on the seven different criteria the type 1a is when the lesion is located in one vertebrae one level this degeneration you cannot see any collapse or abscess or neurologic deficit the treatment plan for this type of classification should only be fine needle biopsy along with drug therapy while in the type b you can usually find an abscess collection 
where abscess drainage and debridement is usually indicated. For the type 2 type of lesion, you usually could find some level of vertebrae collapse or pathological fracture because of the bony involvement. But you could also see here that there are some level, uh, some type of kyphosis which is still correctable with anterior surgery. The treatment choice for this type of condition includes debridement and fusion type of surgery. In existence of any neurologic deficit, then decompression should also be added. Strut cortical bone graft is usually used for the aiding of the fusion. For the last type of this lesion, you could see a severe collapse and also a severe kyphosis here. What you could do here is debridement, decompression and also some correction of the deformity if it does indeed uh, become a pr problem for the patient. The next would be the classification scheme by the Rajasekaran where the kyphotic deformity is classified into several types which is the type 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 3A, B, and C. While for the type 1, usually you cannot find any column deficiency and that what differentiate type 1 and A and 1B is that in 1A, the spine appears to be normal and mobile and also flexible while for the type b there although there are no column deficiency there is some type of fusion that goes on around there in healed condition and there's also an immobile disc spaces for the type 2a and 2b there will be a column deficiency in type 2a there is a anterior column deficiency and for the type 2b there will be only posterior column deficiency for the type 3a 3b and 3c we could see multiple column deficiency for the type 3a there will be both anterior and posterior uh, column deficiency but still with cop angle of less than 60 for the type 3b there will be a cop angle of more than 60 and for the type 3c there will both be both anterior and posterior column deficiency with buckling type of collapse we call it a buckling type of collapse when the anterior surface of the adjacent vertebrae can meet each other because it appears to be enfolded such as depicted here now the question is why do you need to classify it into these types of condition because these types of condition helps us guide the osteotomy of choice the osteotomy could be done through the uh, through the around the area of facet you could take out the whole pedicle you could take out half the bone along with the disc you could even take out the whole vertebrae or even multivertebrectomy or also only salvage procedures such as anterior strut fusion now these conditions uh, to help you guide which type uh, of osteotomy you should use is why you need this classification because in type 1 a you could do a ponty osteotomy for type 1b you could choose a pso which is the pedicle subtraction osteotomy or for the type 2a or 2b you could use a ponty or a pedicle subtraction osteotomy and also for the type 3 there are all sorts of different osteotomy that could be done now next what we are going to discuss is the diagnosis how do you make a good diagnosis well in this video i'm going to cover the history taking and the physical findings while you can check out the additional examination that is required in the spine tuberculosis on the next part of this video for the history taking you generally will find chronic illness malaise night sweats weight loss or even back pain in late cases and these are all usually associated with any sorts of chronic infection physical finding will usually uh, reveal a kyphotic deformity especially at the back region we call it the uh, gibbous and uh, the neurologic deficit is usually present in only around 10 to 47 percent of patients with POTS disease you need to know that POTS disease is also the other name we call a spinal tuberculosis and it could be caused by various things such as mechanical pressure by the abscess granulation tissue tubercular debris caches tissue but also could be caused by mechanical instability such as subluxation or dislocation other causes would include stenosis which is ossification which is 
is caused by the ossification of the ligamentum flavor. Now, for the additional examination, it varies widely from starting from chest x-ray to all the way to the laboratory evaluation and we will discuss this on the second part of this video. Thank you so much for watching. That would be all for today's lesson. Be, su be sure to subscribe to the Orthopedic Tutor for more videos and see you next time.